Hi everyone um, and welcome to this Met interview which is part of the Met Connect Personal Data and Identity Conference. My name is Tim Green, I'm the Features Editor of the Met and I'm here with Nick Mothershaw who's the Chief Identity Strategist of the Open Identity Exchange. And Nick's been working on and thinking about digital identity for many years so we're very grateful for his time and looking forward to hearing his insights. Um, so let's start with uh, the Open Identity Exchange. What, what is it and uh, what's the mission? Uh, so the Open Identity Exchange, it's a members organisation, it's a not-for-profit, and its vision is that, that all of us, uh, you, me, and everyone watching, can have a digital identity that is trusted and is reusable, so that we can go and open a bank account, or prove who we are to travel, or prove who we are to, to prove our age, instantly in a way that is trusted, and that that trust happens not just in the, the country where you live, but happens all over the globe. So it's quite a quite a lofty vision we've got, but it's a, a vision that all our members share. And what we do is work on behalf of our members to to explore how that can be achieved. And that's that involves definition of what good looks like in that space. So we, we define what a trust framework looks like on a global basis for digital identity. Uh, we help those implementing trust frameworks to, to, to implement them in a way that makes them interoperable and makes them uh, you know, aligned across the globe. Uh, we, within that, write various guides around best practice, so things like proofing, fraud controls, complaints. So a lot of what we're doing is not about the technology of identity. In fact, we're technology agnostic. It's about the, the legal constructs, the operational constructs that make it a success. And then we spend a lot of time doing promotion and education. So this, this concept of a digital identity is pretty new. It's taken off in some part of the world, parts of the world already. It's uh, just starting in others and it's, it's you know, fresh ground in many countries. So a lot of what we do is, is educate on this concept and uh, what it is, how it works and principally why it's safe. Why does it work for consumers? Why does it work for organizations? Um, why is it uh, safe uh, and fraud free? Okay, so there's a, obviously a lot to unpack there, and we're going to get into some of those issues over the next half an hour or so. So, first of all, just to kind of establish the groundwork, clearly going from an analog world to a digital world is, is the reason why there are these identity issues now. Can you just sort of summarize what the main challenges are um, that we're facing because we've moved into a different kind of digital world? Yeah, I mean, it goes, it goes back to the internet really and what, how the internet was designed the internet started out as um as arpanet a, a kind of military and then an uh, academic network where everyone was known and it was you you, you had to uh, you know, you'd be you know, vouched into it or brought into it by an organization and then you could use it to collaborate and exchange information at that point everyone was known and everyone was trusted and then it became into the public domain and anyone could publish things and anybody could access those which which was great and it's great for content publishing and therefore it, it was okay to be anonymous certainly on the reading end um, and largely okay to be anonymous on the publishing end what then happened is we moved into commerce and trade on the internet and that that then needs trust so we moved into dealing with governments via the internet and, and accessing their services and, and you know, paying taxes or applying for benefits we moved into banking on the internet we moved into buying and e-commerce on the internet so at that point we needed to know who organizations were dealing with uh, and that could be individuals it could be other organizations but suddenly now there's a need for trust and the internet was never designed to cope with that uh, certainly in a in a way uh, for the mass public uh, so that was dealt with by each individual organization working out whether they could trust the user they were dealing with. And you know, this is what we see uh, day in, day out, everywhere we go. Uh, we have to prove who we are, um, go through all of our details of our name and address, contact details for higher trust services, you know, providing proofs of who we are, maybe utility bills, passports, increasingly we were being asked to, to scan our passports and take a selfie and have that cross-matched and all of that is very painful for users and users abandon they walk away from the from those um, scenarios and it's very expensive for organizations uh, because each individual organization has to separately implement and manage all of this identity proofing and identity uh, access management solutions themselves which um, creates a colossal cost uh, for those organizations that uh, that are trying to do business um, and or you know 
public services that are trying to access their citizens um, in the digital domain. So clearly there's um, great shortcomings with the way we do identity at the moment um, online. Can you, can you just dive a little bit deeper into what the uh, challenges are with the existing um, processes that we use, whether it's passwords, uh, two-factor authentication, biometrics? What, what are the specific challenges with some of those existing processes? Yeah, there's, there's kind of two, there's two, two challenges. One, one is when I first come to an organisation, how do I prove who I am and how do I set up an account? So that's all the proofing process that I've just, just talked about. When I've then established a relationship with an organization, I need to reaccess my account or my services with them. That's where I'm issued with a, with a username and a password. And um, increasingly, you know, passwords are seen as insecure and, and they are, they're, they're vulnerable. They're, they're a really, really poor way of, uh, of you know, securing an account. Um, they are fished, uh, they are vulnerable to data breach and then you know, can be uh, decrypted with the right, right software. Um, so that whole area of you know, accessing an account and protecting accounts with something as basic as a password is extremely vulnerable. And that's why we're seeing extra factors being added in. That's why we're seeing you know, people now sending SMSs out to our mobile phone, but that's not great. And there's things like SIM swap risk involved in there. Um, it's not really possible to verify the ownership of the phone. You can validate it's in my possession when I set up the account and bind it to me at that point as, as my phone, but it doesn't mean it's my phone, it could be someone else's phone. Uh, it's difficult to validate that. So and increasingly, as organisations try and raise the security barrier there, that increases cost. So we're seeing them move towards biometrics to do that. Um, now, biometrics is really where this industry is going to be heading. Um, there's three types of authenticators you'll hear talked about. There's things that you know, which is a passport, passport, uh, sorry, a password, <laughs> things that you know, which is a password. There's things that you are, which is your biometrics, and there's things that you have, which are tokens. Um, this is often you know, referred to uh, knowledge, your password, inheritance, your uh, you know, things that you are, and uh, possession, which is um, your, uh, your tokens that you may have, which would be you know, a, a code reader or a, or a card, or you know, a bank card is a possession factor. Um, knowledge is good in a way because it's something that, that is, you know, is something only we know. But when knowledge is a password and it's something we create and reuse, and you know, it, and either they're difficult to remember because they're all different, or we just use the same one, or we use a tool to remember them for us, or even worse, we write them down. Uh, it's not a great factor. Possession is great because it means I've got to have something. But if I lose that thing or it breaks, that then becomes a uh, you know, a, a difficult factor for me to replace. Biometrics is something I always have, something I always am. Uh, so that, and that doesn't change. It changes, some biometrics change over my lifetime. Um, and, you know, as I age, my face will change a bit, but it's, it's geometry doesn't uh, change in particular. Um, so biometrics are a much better way of um, securing who an individual is and enabling them to access their account. The problem is it's a bit spooky. So there's this kind of connotation with biometrics that, you know, you, reading my face is a bit, a bit sci-fi. It's, it's a bit, um, you know, we all remember the, the you know, Tom Cruise film where he walks along and they say it gets advertised and, you know, because they are recognizing his face. And at that stage, it's spooky, but that I think will become a reality with our consent and control that our biometrics will be used, you know, readily as a, as a way of, identifying ourselves and that won't be the biometric that's on my phone because that's just a, a pseudo password it's just a you know a, a front on my passport it will be off device biometrics strong biometrics to to international standards that are held with our consent in the cloud i mean there's a difference between facial recognition and facial authentication um isn't there so um that uh, obviously is the public needs to be more aware of that and that might allay some of the fear but um, just to um, sort of get back to definitions, you've talked very eloquently there about um, different authentication methods, but that they are authentication methods, they're not identity. Um, there That's is a right. difference. Um, so can you just clarify the difference between authentication and identity? Yeah, absolutely. So my, you know, my identity is, is mine, it's unique and I should own it. So we're, we're very much moving towards user centricity 
in terms of managing of identity. And my identity is really the attributes about me. It includes, it includes my face, it includes my biometric attributes, it includes the, the things I've been given to identify me in society, my name, um, my address, where I live, my date of birth is a record of when I first you know, started my existence uh, on this planet. Um, but then it also includes things I'm eligible to do and things I've collected as I, I've gone along through my life. And they may be things like passports, which are not really an identity document, they're a travel document. And maybe my driving license, which actually says I'm entitled to drive something. Again, it's not an identity document, it's often used as one, but what it actually says is I'm entitled to drive a car and a motorbike, but not a lorry in my instance. So, and then things like my education certificates, my health information increasingly is digitized and we're all become accustomed to using digitized health information to prove that we have been vaccinated against COVID and to prove that we've had a recent test in order to travel, for instance. So these are all attributes about myself. They all form part of my identity as a whole and they are mine. They're all mine and I need to be able to manage them. But in order for you to know that they're mine, there needs to be a level of trust established in me and the association between me and those attributes. So in order to know that it's my COVID certificate, when that is given to me, there's got to be a, a trust relationship between me and the health agency that's giving it me so that we know that it's mine. And then when I present that, that trust relationship has got to be you know, leveraged. And this is where authentication comes in, or authenticators. So what we, what we actually see in, as we define the way dig, digital identity works is I get digital attributes, they collectively form credentials. So my passport is a credential, my COVID vaccination certificate is a credential. And those individual credentials can have associated with them individual authenticators. So if I want to assert my COVID vaccine status, the authenticator I need to use is my face, because that's what was agreed between me and the health provider when I was given that, that credential. So, and so to present it to anyone else, I need to use my face. They don't need to see my face. The digital identity ecosystem deals with that trust. This is where a trust framework comes in. So that whoever I'm presenting my vaccine certificate or my passport to can accept it with trust, legal trust that it is mine and that the trust between me and that information has been established by a legal framework. Okay, well, I know that this is coming to the heart of, of what uh, your organisation is interested in. But just before we sort of dive into the, the frameworks and the regulation, um, is the industry converging towards a kind of a certain methodology for um, where you store your identity and how you authenticate it? I know that there's talk about like having a government issued or federated or even a self-sovereign identity. So maybe you can talk a little bit about the different approaches and, and if you have any idea about which direction we're going in. Yes, absolutely. Um, I talked earlier about user centricity uh, and at OAX, you know, we believe that users own their data and it is theirs and they need to be given tools to securely manage that. Um, we hear terms like centralised, decentralised and federated. So let me let me unpack those terms a little bit. Um, so centralised means that the, the storage and um, delivery of an identity for me as a user is done centrally. Uh, and that could be done centrally by a government on behalf of all its citizens. It can be done centrally by an identity provider who does it in a central database of my choice. Um, the decentralized side means that actually, rather than th th that information being stored in a central database by a government or their agent or a private company, the storage of that and the management of it is done by me. It's decentralized, straight distributed. And that means I either have that data often on my device, but what it definitely means is I have that data in a, in a segment and this is mine and mine alone, and that is separated from everybody else's. So as, the, as we evolve, we'll hear a lot about device centric identity and the distributed or decentralized identity is on device identity. In reality, it's on a device at a moment in time, but it's also backed up in the cloud somewhere. And so it's important we don't get identities becoming device bound because if my device breaks or is stolen, 
or I, I need a new one, that is then a problem for me as the user. So actually, what we see is our identities are individually packaged, user-centric, probably cloud-based facilities that only I can control and manage. So if that were to be stolen, only mine is stolen, not everybody else's. This risk of central data breach that centralized systems have then goes away because we've distributed that data. And we often hear things like blockchain being used as part of that distributed uh, architecture, but again, not necessary. It's, it's one technology in order to achieve that. Now, federation is a bit different. So federation is sometimes described as a step between that centralization where there is a single identity provider and distribution where there are many identity providers. Federation in our, in our definition continues. What federation means is there is a choice of identity providers. And it means I can use one identity with many different organizations. And that is the same, whether it's a centralized architecture or a distributed architecture. So we, we see this you know, already where you are using something like a, a Facebook identity or a Google identity to log on in lots of different places. That's an example of federation, but it's federation with little trust. Where, we, where we're moving to is more user managed data. So rather than Google and Facebook managing it, me managing it in a way through tools or you know, wallets that I choose to you know, as my provider in a discrete user centric package, but I can still use that with many different places. So the federation model prevails through this migration from centralized to decentralized. Maybe you could walk us through some of the um, initiatives and projects that have been launched um, in various places around the world. Um, IDAS is, is perhaps the obvious one to start with, but if you could just give us a guide on uh, where we're at with having some kind of universally recognized ID that everybody can use and everybody accepts. So we, we've been talking about trust frameworks for over 10 years. And you know our first kind of definition of a trust framework for identity is from 2012, so it's 10 years old now. Um, over that time, we've evolved our thinking. We've seen the emergence of self-sovereign identity, which is, is very much user-centric distributed um, vision. We're absolutely aligned with that. Uh, and we publish now a guide to trust framework. So you can go onto our website and see our guide. And it's, like, it's a series of guides. There's an overarching guide to what is a digital identity or a smart digital identity, as we now term it. And how does a trust framework support that and make it a success? And then there are more detailed guides below that as to things like proofing, fraud controls, complaints. Um, we've done a, a, a recent one um, yeah, around principles and trust marks as well. So we've got various different guides that explain how digital identity works. Then around the globe, different either governments or groups of organizations are implementing trust frameworks. So you refer to EIDAS, that's the EU's trust framework first launched in 2014 and now being rapidly and heavily evolved um, into, a, into a, the, what's known as the European Union Digital Identity Wallet. Now, I'll, I'll come back to this in a moment because it's a very interesting project to talk in more detail about, but it's one of many around the world. So you've got Adhar in India, um, you know, millions and millions and billions of people evolved in there in having a digital identity that's um, basically and government endorsed. Um, you've got places like Canada with DIAC, uh, Australia with this, with this TDIF uh, trust framework. In the US, you've got something called NIST, which is a it's more of a set of standards that, that's evolving to a framework around proofing and authentication and how you how you do that. Um, you've got bank-based implementations in places like Norway, Sweden, where the bank ID is used as an ID to access not just banks, but governments and private sector services as well. And you've got similar uh, situation in Canada. In many places, in many more emerging economies, you've got phone-based identities that are based around the, the, the SIM and the provision from the phone company. So this is happening in, in pockets all over the world. And it's happening in a similar way because we've been talking about trust frameworks. People use the term trust frameworks and they implement them, but they've implemented them at different times and on different platforms with different technologies. So while they all kind of do the same thing, they don't interoperate at the moment. So this is one of our, our goals right now. We're looking at how do you make what's been implemented so far interoperate and what will be done next, make sure it's implemented in, in such a way that it's more easy 
to inter make it interoperable as we go forward. So this is going on all over the globe. In Europe, um, you've got EIDAS. Now, EIDAS first came through in 2014, primarily for accessing public sector services in Europe, and it enabled member states to notify identity schemes, uh, digital identity schemes. Some, ident some created a single one for the country um, and notified that. Some created several, so I think Italy have got three, for instance. Some of those are created directly by the government. Some are created by a private sector partnership with government. Um, in the EU's view, it has not been as successful as they hoped. It's um, given the amount of time it's been going, it's actually, I think, been pretty successful. These things take a long time to get going. But in order to, to really get it accelerated and move it with some you know, more modern thinking, they've, you know, doing what people generally refer to as the IDAS2. Uh, which is the introduction of the European Digital Identity Wallet or UD Wallet. Um, and now they're using the term wallet um, for something that is that could be a physical wallet on a phone. It could be something much more virtual, um, but it's essentially a digital identity that will enable the user to have a PID in it, which is their core identity data issued to them via their government and endorsed via their member state government into their wallet. And then it will enable them to collect other credentials from electronic attribute providers uh, into that wallet and to share those, not just for public sector services access, but for private sector services access. In fact, it demands, as it's written today, that areas such as travel, finance, accept a UD wallet as proof of the user's identity in the same way as they would accept a national ID card, or a passport or maybe a driving license today. So it's quite far reaching. It's very forward thinking. It's structurally, it's very aligned with our thinking at OAX. So we released in January our latest trust framework. Uh, in March, we saw the expert group from the, uh, from the EU release its first thinking on the UD wallet. And they are virtually entirely aligned. Some of the terminology is different, and actually, I think some of the EU's terminology is better than ours, so we'll be looking at how we evolve what we've uh, what we've said so far. But very pleased that you know we are in harmony with what's going on in uh, that massive economic block. And certainly now, I would say what the EU there are doing is leading the world in terms of digital identity thinking. Um, alongside that, in the UK, of course, which we're no longer part of Europe, we've got um, DCMS here in the UK creating the digital identity and attribute trust framework for the UK. And that will enable the creation of digital identities uh, in the UK to a framework. Um, identity providers will be able to be certified and those identities will then be able to be used largely in private sector use cases. And there's various schemes in play, looking at uh, property buying and selling, uh, opening financial accounts and you know, financial remediation. Uh, the one that's kind of in play already is around employment, right to work, and also right to rent, um, which is kind of high, high trust use cases um, that the, where the framework is being piloted uh, as those we come into the summer. And then there's various other use cases around education being, being looked at, travel, um, which I mean in the UK, the citizens will be able to get a, a certified identity, which will carry a UK-based trust mark that will then be interoperable across sectors. But in the UK, we're going very much for a, a more of a free market in the private sector around that digital identity delivery and ecosystem, uh, whereas the EU's approach is a bit more government-led, state-centric. If we stick with the example of the IDAS, then um, what, what does it actually look like in practice? So uh, you described how an individual will apply um, for the wallet and then they will populate the wallet with various identity markers. Mm. But what does that actually look like? Where do you go to... Uh, to get the wallet um how do you import different disparate identities onto it uh and how do uh, retailers and other agencies um actually use it and so and, and, and kind of how do they get compatible with it on their systems okay so a lot of that isn't defined yet so it's still being worked on by the expert group there is a toolbox being defined which will talk about how the identity is constructed at the moment, it's very much in a, in a logical, uh, functional stage. Um, the physical 
implementation, I think a lot of it will be left down to individual member states. Um, so how I get my ID in, in Germany versus Italy may be quite different. Um, the obligation is that the member states must enable users to have an identity uh, in a UD wallet format, but how they get it could vary. And it could vary from governments issuing them directly to governments going out with various private sector partners for them to be established. Once I've got one, again, logically, they should all contain the same structure. They contain my core identity information as provided by my government and other credentials that they I would then add to that. And the construct so far supports me getting those from what's known as qualified um, attribute providers and non-qualified attribute providers. Qualified ones do all of that with a digital signature combined in it, so it's very high trust. When I've got that, I then need to be able to you know, assert my information out to uh, those who need to know who I am and what I'm entitled to do. In terms of organisations who are going to then access identity information from the wallet with the user's consent and permission, uh, they'll be able to ask for you know, a, a data minimised set. So if you are um, simply need to know the user's 18, you can simply ask for that. Uh, if you need to know more about the user, say you're opening a financial account for them and you need to know their full name, date of birth, maybe some of their address history, um, the, the full evidence that goes with that from an AML point of view, you can ask for that. And something like the Open Identity Foundation's OIDC for ID Assurance is a protocol that enables those requests to be formulated and to, for data minimized responses to be sent back. And another key thing about the wallet is it must work offline. It must not be dependent on the internet being present to be able to assert this data. So it's got to be able to hold locally, at least for a short time, data and vital information that's needed to complete transactions uh, on behalf of the user. Well, speaking of that offline component, that sort of brings us on to the whole inclusion element because you've talked a lot about, um, you know, storing uh, data on devices and so on, but not everybody is digitally savvy or even digitally included. So how will some of these systems work for people who don't have smartphones uh, and not very internet savvy and so on? Yeah, and inclusion is, is really important. So at OEX last year, we did a piece of work where we released a report which talked about the ID challenged. And what it identified is that there are huge segments of society who will struggle to get an identity electronically. So what we're focusing on with that point, with that report, was the ability to establish a digital identity through either having a passport, a driving license, or some other data sources that enabled you to, to prove who you are. And we identified that in the UK, 11% of people will not be able to get through that process based on documents or data. So they will need assistance to get into the process. And there's two kinds of assistance. One is for people who simply don't have the data footprint. So either we need access to more data sources, which is something we're campaigning for. So things like access to government data from benefits agencies or tax agencies. Uh, so you know, governments tend to know you one way or another, you're either paying tax or they're giving you, giving you money. So if you can get it, that data, it's a good source of validation about the individual. Um, but we're also then looking at vouching. So to bring everybody into the ecosystem, we're going to need to trust those in society who know others and will vouch for them on a legal basis and we'll bring them into the digital ecosystem. So that's one kind of assistance. How do we get people into it? But how do we assist those people who find digital difficult? Um, so we've got a number of members who are working on assisted digital programs. So where um, Timson, for instance, one of our board members uh, is looking at how do they put into their stores uh, assisted digital processes. So people can go in with things like um, birth certificates and utility bills and be taken through with one of their agents a process that gets them a digital ID. Uh, so this isn't, you know, it doesn't have to be entirely digital. There is help to get you into the ecosystem. And then ultimately the delegated authority as well. So my mother, who's in her 90s, will never have a digital ID. She hasn't even got a phone, mobile phone. Um, but there's getting points where already she needs to trade digitally to, to manage her national savings and investments in the UK. Um, she has to have a digital account with them, which she's got and she's got yeah, but I have to help her manage that. So we're going to need delegated authority. And we're going to need the ability for, for those people who choose to or those people who, who need to have assistance 
that delegated authority can be given and someone else can act digitally on their behalf. Uh, and it's really important that's built in to trust ecosystems from day one and not as an afterthought. Otherwise, we're going to exclude people um, in a really bad way as we start to, to, to roll this out. And that, and that will not be acceptable. So we, we run a, uh, an inclusion steering committee, which inclu includes in the UK people like DCMS, DWP, um, and you know, many of our board members are on that committee as well, because we, we know that this is a, a key area that we've got to get right if digital identity is going to be a success. Well, somebody who's not digitally savvy, um, you know, once they've got these attributes um, and they have digital identity set up, what about asserting those uh, attributes? It, it, I mean, I know that you can now get smart cards that have fingerprints on them. Is, is that the kind of thing that you think might help us help those groups to, you know, come into this? Yeah, I think so. A lot of it depends whether you're in a face to face situation or remote. So this is where I think biometrics will play a big role. Um, I'm not sure whether fingerprint face is much more accessible biometric, um, uh, less intrusively captured. Uh, but yes, I think we'll definitely see um, ways of, of asserting IDs and ways of people consenting to their ID information being shared in a trusted manner with people who they trust in a way that makes their interaction seamless. So for instance, if I want to get on a plane and I know I'm going to do that, I can pre-consent to share my data with literally a nod of my head as I go through biometric sensors that will share information with the airport, with the airline, with airline security, with border. Um, that means my whole journey through that process is much easier. And that, again, could be set up for me as a delegated process um, for those who, are, who find that difficult. Okay, well, um, we could have gone on for hours. I always say that about these conversations, but it's genuinely true. It's such a fascinating topic and it's so important as well. So, uh, but thanks, Nick, for, for all your insights and for joining us today. And um, I'm assuming that um, there's lots of resources on the Open Identity Exchanges website for anyone who wants to dig in further. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes, uh, www.openidentityexchange.org. Um, go along there. And yes, there's uh, guides on there. There's 10 years worth of papers on there as well. Uh, various member papers. Uh, there's a directory of member services uh, on there as well, so you can see who can provide what in this ecosystem and a whole series of, of events that we're involved in uh, where you can come and find out more.